A lot of folks don't realize that in 2007, the United States is the third largest oil producer on the planet. Only the Saudis and the Russians produce more than we do. We produce more than 8 million barrels of oil every day. Iran produces 4 million. Iraq produces 2 million. Even if we drilled in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, even if we opened up all of the Atlantic and Pacific Coast oil drilling, we would still be importing more than half of our oil. The problem in the United States is not one of inadequate production. It is of runaway consumption. Every day, Americans use 21 million barrels of oil. One out of every four barrels of oil on the planet are used here in the United States. And we use that oil the most inefficiently of any of our economic competitors in Europe and Asia. We use double the oil per person. Now, Vice President Dick Cheney said uh, after he released his uh, energy policy report in 2001 that, you know, conservation is a fine personal virtue, but it's no basis for energy policy. <laughs> well, there's a reason that he says that. Because energy companies don't make money when we're more efficient. American families make more money when we use less energy, but ExxonMobil makes more money when they sell you more oil. Coal companies and nuclear power companies make more money the more they sell. So from Vice President Dick Cheney's standpoint, he has prioritized, and others have prioritized, an energy policy that focuses exclusively on energy production. As a result, three quarters of all of the uh, subsidies in the Department of Energy that go to energy, uh, whether it's for energy production or, or energy efficiency, three quarters of it are taken up by oil, coal, and nuclear. And only 8% of the Department of Energy's entire spending is for wind and solar and geothermal, and only 16% is for energy efficiency. The oil industry alone when you combine tax breaks, royalty relief, because remember, the United States, you know, we produce 8 million barrels of oil a day. A third of that is from land that we all own on federal land. A third of our oil comes from that. And increasingly, oil companies are paying little to no royalties for the privilege. So when you combine tax breaks and royalty relief, the oil industry is receiving about $8 billion a year in subsidies from us. While incentives for energy efficiency and renewable energy are very small and often temporary in comparison. For example, the most expensive energy bill in American history, which President Bush signed into law in 2005, which adopted nearly all of Vice President Dick Cheney's recommendations, contains some very small uh, incentives for energy efficiency. However, they all expire after a couple of years. By the way, none of the $9 billion in subsidies to the coal industry expire. None of the $5 billion in subsidies to the oil companies expire. So the, the history has been subsidies to fossil fuels make them big and permanent. Subsidies for American families to use energy more wisely are small and temporary. Now, we have all of this because we have an energy policy that has been bought by the energy companies. Uh, since 2000, the energy industry, coal, oil, and nukes, have given $200 million in campaign contributions three quarters of that going to Republicans. They've spent an additional $1 billion lobbying the federal government. So in the oil industry, um, we've seen massive consolidation recently. Exxon and Mobil were two giant global competitors. They're now on the same side. Same with Chevron Texaco, ConocoPhillips. Uh, the list goes on and on. And that, uh, those mergers have, have consolidated corporate and political power, uh, making them uh, extremely powerful. I mean, ExxonMobil alone now produces more oil every day than the entire kingdom of Kuwait. So these companies not only have a huge presence in the United States, but a huge global presence. And that has translated into huge profits. Since President Bush took office, the largest six companies have earned $477 billion in profits. Now, there's a direct connection between the record profits that the oil companies are making and the record prices that we're paying at the pump. Now, in Europe, people pay a heck of a lot more than we do for a gallon of gas. In fact, the average uh, a gallon of gas in Europe costs about $7, whereas here it's uh, about $3.20. Over $4 of that in countries like Germany, France, and England are in the form of taxes. 
Whereas in the United States, the average federal and local taxes is about 38 or 39 cents a gallon. But in Europe, you know, you've got much older cities where that were settled before the age of the automobile. So you have the ability of people to uh, have access to mass transit. Those gas taxes heavily subsidize mass transit. Um, in the United States, what are the high prices that we're paying at the pump? What is it being invested in? You know, we haven't increased the gas tax in over 10 years. So let's look at what the oil companies are making from the record high prices that we're paying at the retail level. Last year, for example, ExxonMobil spent in one year $37 billion buying back its stock and paying dividends to its shareholders. How much did they spend on alternative fuels? Zero. They spent nothing. They do not have an alternative fuel program. Now, another big issue in oil markets has been deregulation of energy trading markets. Uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon. In the year 2000, a uh, company, some of you might have heard of it, it's called Enron, um, successfully lobbied Congress to pass something called the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. And what that did for the first time is that it deregulated energy futures markets. You know, the price of oil and gasoline is not set in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It is set by energy traders who are comprised mainly of oil companies and financial firms like hedge funds and investment banks. And because of this deregulation move, more than half of all the trades that set prices are done on exchanges completely free from government oversight. In fact, the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission has said that they don't know who is trading. They don't know the kinds of volumes that are uh, being traded. And in April, the Wall Street Journal had this great article quoting an energy trader. The, the article was about this mystery price spike that happened one day where prices jumped up like 15% and nobody knew what was going on. And uh, it, it talked about how all this energy trading is now deregulated, nobody knows anything. And this one energy trader, who apparently isn't in the know, said, uh, you know, this initial jump made us all think that somebody must know something. <laughs> the more prices rose, the more it seemed somebody knew something. So they all jumped in and kept buying like Goldman Sachs, which is the largest energy commodities trader on the planet, um, they are now one of the biggest oil companies in the United States. They just acquired Kinder Morgan and its 43,000 miles of, uh, of uh, crude oil and gasoline pipelines. They own oil refineries. They own storage facilities. They own oil. They own 1,600 gas wells. They are a huge trader, but in, in some we have to repeal all the tax breaks, repeal all the royalty relief, and enact some form of windfall profits tax on the industry to have oil companies take the lead in financing government investments in mass transit, because right now only one out of every five dollars in the transportation budget goes to uh, mass transit, uh, uh, the rest goes to highways. Uh, we have to strengthen antitrust laws, uh, give the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, more authority, re-regulate energy trading exchanges, and of course, no-brainer, um, increase fuel economy standards to 40 miles a gallon over the next decade. The defining characteristic of electric power over the last decade has been deregulation. And deregulation has been a complete disaster. It has raised rates everywhere. It has encouraged the use of coal and nuclear because in a deregulated market, the price is largely set by natural gas, which is very expensive. So if you are sitting on a 30 or 40 year old coal or nuclear fired power plant, as our friends in the Illinois Attorney General's office has documented, they're earning 260% rate of return. Joe Kelleher is the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and he has jurisdiction over electric policy in, in America. He is promoting runaway policies of deregulation that enrich corporations that promote coal and nuclear power, they do not review daily rates, and as a result, we're paying much higher prices and relying on coal and nuclear like never before. Um, and there's a new nuclear power revival. There's over 17 new proposals to build new nuclear power plants. There are over 150 new coal-fired power plants that are being proposed around the country. And again, huge subsidies are being involved. And carbon sequestration is not an answer, it is a problem. Nuclear power is not an answer because it creates hundreds of tons of highly radioactive waste. It is a brand new problem. Um, and cap and trade programs 
which is a market-based solution to environmental protection. When in the history of, of society has markets ever successfully protected the environment? Never. Relying on market-based solutions for environmental protection is a travesty. What we instead need is to follow the lead of states. 22 states have adopted renewable energy standards, not coaxing utilities into using more renewable energy, legally mandating and requiring them to. We need to provide bigger incentives so that families can actually afford to install home solar units on their homes. And yet we still do not have a solar re uh, revolution. It's, t it's time for Americans to take it back.